Welcome to Airbus. Welcome to our Airbus podcast. I'm Martin Aguera and I'm a member of the communications department at Airbus. After a series of podcasts last year to commemorate our 50th anniversary, we are now back with you. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are affecting every area of society, from public health and industrial production to the ways we connect with each other every day. Traditionally, 2020 2020 would have been a busy airshow year. Our teams were looking forward to updating you on the many new developments and business opportunities in our industry at various trade shows, such as the ELA Berlin Air Show in Berlin, the Eurosatory in Paris, or the Farnborough International Air Show near London. As of now, the significant meeting, travel, and event restrictions have made physically hosting these shows impossible. That's why we've decided to bring you some of the stories in a digital format, among others with a podcast. One of the big stories this year is definitely the Eurofighter Typhoon and its future development. I'm happy to welcome a good friend of mine and special guests to the first podcast with Marco Gumbrecht. Marco is a former Eurofighter Typhoon fighter pilot in the German Air Force and has flown the jet for many years. After retiring from the Air Force at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, he joined Airbus Defense and Space several years ago, where he's now leading Eurofighter Future Business. Marco, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martin. It's uh, great to be with you. Marco, you spent considerable time uh, in the German Air Force as a career officer and fighter pilot. Before we get started, uh, maybe, you know, introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, of course. So, uh, as you said, uh, Marco Gumbrecht, uh, I was uh, working for the German Air Force, or in the German Air Force, for uh, 20 years. Uh, pretty much uh, straight after uh, high school, um, uh, went to the service and spent 20 years there. And uh, actually, as some people's... Uh, or some kids dream at least, uh, I always wanted to become a pilot and uh, my parents thought I was crazy, really, because they had nothing to do with the military and, and with flying, but I kind of uh, uh, pushed that through and so had 20 incredible years uh, with the Air Force, the, with the Luftwaffe, and uh, the privilege to fly uh, fighters for 16 of those years. And how many years uh, did you fly the Eurofighter or Typhoon uh, out of these 16 years? Almost 11 years, so uh, almost uh, 10 and 3 quarters, so to say. That's quite a bit. So I'm sure you had uh, a lot of experiences in that jet. Um, over all those 11 years flying the Eurofighter Typhoon, what has made this profession uh, so special to you? And what has made flying the Eurofighter so special for you? Well, I mean, before I get to the, you know, to the Eurofighter, first of all, uh, to me, it's just a, it's a, it's a profession you have to be very, you have to feel to be very pri privileged to be able to do it. So you know, it's something that, uh, as I said, it's a lot of people's dreams uh, uh, to do something like that. And, you know, some can fulfill them, some not. So first and foremost, it was just a very special thing to me to be able to, you know, really uh, literally live my childhood dream for uh, for such a long time. Um, then, of course, you know, it's uh, it's the technology, flying such a machine, just seeing things that very few people get to see, you know, be it... Uh, on a bad day, on a, on, a, on a bad rainy day, you can pretty much go out and, and almost see the sun every day, you know, and just, just having incredible experiences. And this obviously the technology is fascinating, but I have to say, you know, uh, at the end of the day, if I now recap on the 20 years above the technology, it's just the, uh, really the people uh, they have to work with. Uh, I know it sound, might sound a bit corny, but uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's also a very special group of people uh, in that community um, and uh, uh, having lived and work with these people so closely for 20 years is really a privilege. And then as well, also, you know, to me, it's an important fact of also serving my country for 20 years. So it's a combination of these things, um, but certainly the people factor at the end, to me, even stands out above the, uh, the technology factor. Right, right. And uh, people always say that the, those that know the fighter pilot community say that they're a special breed. Um, <laughs> besides... Um, Besides the Eurofighter, uh, what other, uh, you know, for our audience to know, maybe what other uh, aircraft types uh, did you have a chance to fly? 
Yeah, so before the Eurofighter, I had the uh, privilege of, of flying the good old F4 Phantom uh, for uh, five years. I mean, some people might, uh, you know, kind of laugh about it now, but honestly, uh, it's kind of the first love. So uh, that was the jet I wanted to fly when I got to the Luftwaffe. Uh, very happy to be able to fly that jet. And yes, it was an old jet, but some uh, with some pretty good weapons and, and radars due to upgrades uh, uh, the Luftwaffe did. Uh, and it really was, let's say, uh, you learn the, the tricks of the trade, you know, a, a real uh, old school flying. Um, no, uh, no digital fiber wire, or these, uh, these fancy things. Um, b before that, uh, the trainers, just the T-38, uh, T-37, just uh, typical trainers. Um, they're used in the NATO, uh, NATO training and then prop before that. And uh, I mean, most pilots in your career at some point or another, you get so-called incentive rides or as we like to say, sandbag rides. Uh, it's just with... Uh, you know, uh, with other nations on exchanges. So uh, I had the privilege to fly in the, uh, in the F-18, F-16, uh, and MiG-29 when I was still operating in the Luftwaffe. So uh, um, let me think, I think that's actually it. I about 10, 10 rides on the F-16. So um, yeah, just a, a pretty good idea of, of what's out there. Ah, oh, Rafael uh, as well, I missed that one. Yeah, so uh, that, that gives you a broad overview of, uh, of the uh, technology and the aircraft that are out there. and. My question to you would be, um, you know, with with that experience, uh, you know, on, on your back, um, what distinguishes the Typhoon from all these other jets? Is there anything that, you know, that distinguishes really that plane from the others? Well, I'm probably the worst person to ask because I love that airplane. But uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, any one thing that nobody will negate who, who has sat in the jet or have flown with or against it, let's say, is just the, the pure performance, the, so the pure power of the jet. So... You know, what it was originally uh, built around, its DNA, you know, is just in air-to-air in -air performance or air vehicle performance. Uh, and, and that jet really, uh, it might not be second to none, but it's definitely top tier. Okay, so there's no no other jet out there, uh, even the newest ones coming off the line that we have to fear uh, in any, uh, as far as maneuverability is concerned. As far as the, uh, um, you know, the, the what to me is always very important is how well do you feel in the jet? Like, I mean, what is the comfort Comfort, comfy factor almost, you know, so you can have a, you can have an awesome radar, you can have awesome engines, you can have awesome weapons, but at the end, you need to feel comfortable, uh, all that stuff, you know, is, uh, is, is fused together and, and how that comes together as one weapon system. And I think uh, that is really pretty unique, at least unique to me, uh, that I, there's no other jet I've, I've felt as comfortable in uh, as in the Typhoon. You know, when it comes then to weapons, obviously there's a lot of similarities between, uh, especially amongst NATO partners, and AMRAM is the best example. I don't think there's a NATO country that does not fly with the AMRAM. Um, obviously, there's some difference in sensors, etc. But to me, the two things that stand out really is just the sheer performance, and then just uh, you know the jet makes you feel comfortable, and that's incredibly important. Yeah, one of the things that um, I learned from a lot of the pilots, and that's um, the comments that you get all the time. They praise the two engines, and they say it's it's probably the most reliable they've ever seen. It never lets you down would you back that up probably not the best business uh, uh <laughs> business they have because that that jet engine never breaks uh, and certainly also now looking into some of the improvements that we can do um the jet engines like everybody's like yeah you know a bit would be nice there's a good saying uh, the only thing better than thrust is more thrust so uh you know it, it would be nice but it's certainly not on the top tier to do things so uh it makes me feel bad for eurojet but uh, that's just a compliment, you know, to to uh, to uh, MTU and Rolls Royce for the uh, awesome engine they they've really made. So yeah, I can one hundred percent back that. The Eurofighter's been been around for a while now, and you you've flown it for eleven years. I I believe you you once told me that you were pretty much involved with the Eurofighter from more or less the uh, the beginnings of its operational use in the uh, in the German Air Force. Um, so you've seen that jet also grow and you've seen it mature in the service. Um, can you tell us a bit about that evolution? So, you know, from where have you gone over these years and, and where do we stand with that plane right now? Yeah, so when I started flying the jet, I mean, uh, uh, Lage, uh, in Germany at least, Lager, the training wing, has been flying for about a year and a half, two years, um, but they're really just doing the initial operational evaluation testing uh, in, in a you know, real training environment. And then uh, myself at that time being in Neuburg, Fighter Wing 74, by the way, the best wing uh, in Germany, I'd like to say that, um, is uh, we started picking up QA duties in parallel with the, uh, with the F-4 Phantom. So um, it, you know, when we got the jet, it was just getting the basics down, but because of QA, so the, our, your sovereign rights are so important, it was really taking the basic steps to make sure that we have a robust uh, weapon system 
able to fulfill that duty. And once we got that matured, and then in 2008, when Neuburg took over uh, QA duties for Germany, and uh, at least for southern Germany, and relieved the F4 Phantom, you know, then we started taking to the next evolutionary step, which was uh, filling the gap in the overall air-to-air -air domain uh, spectrum. So, uh, you know, not that we hadn't done that before, but not with the same intensity. So focusing now on, on beyond digital range employment uh, tactics, uh, you know, really exploiting the sensors uh, in the beyond visual range environment. And, uh, you know, once we got that done, then obviously the next step also in the evolution of the weapon system was the introduction of air to surface, air to ground, air to ground employment. And, uh, you know, that's still going on. Uh, the, the jet is definitely, uh, for instance, in the UK, it, it literally took over from the tornado. So it is the single platform uh, in a lot of countries for both roles. Uh, in Germany, this is still uh, happening. Let's say it's, uh, it's uh, we're not quite as far as some some other countries, but uh, so really from basic uh, QA task in air to air to uh, dominating in the air to air spectrum to now uh, getting uh, you know more uh, more width in the air to ground spectrum. That's that's the uh, uh, that's the evolution. And I mean, people forget that jet is not or that jet the typhoon is on operations twenty four seven worldwide. So not just on QA duties. Uh, in, in continental Europe, but we have it in the Falkland Islands, we have on the Baltics, we have jets deployed uh, in, in, uh, for Italy and the UK, supporting the, uh, the troops in, in Syria and Iraq. So the jet is just proven, constantly proving its worth. Um, but off, obviously also, you know, we're realizing, I'm sure we'll get to that, uh, that there's also some, some improvements that we need to do to make sure it stays relevant in the future. Right. For all, uh, for all non-fighter pilot types uh, listening to the podcast uh, that might wonder what QRA stands for, QRA is the Quick Reaction Alert, and uh, in, in a nutshell, it is the, yeah, the alert capability. You are always in a certain wing uh, have a couple of aircraft on alert 24-7, that, and you might be able to complement that, uh, Marco, that if a if uh, if there is a threat arising, those planes would have to be airborne within 15 minutes, correct? Yeah, sorry. First of all, uh, some literate talk, yeah, QRA, quick reaction alert. And yes, 15 minutes is the usual posture or readiness state, uh, as, as we or I used to like to call it. Uh, and then that can be increased. So it can go down all the way to uh, two minutes. Um, uh, yeah, so 15 minutes in general is, is what the jets are on. Yes. All right. Yeah, you mentioned it. I mean, you, are, you aren't heading future business for no reason at Airbus Defense and Space. Um, you're convinced that the, uh, the Eurofighter Typhoon has lots more in store uh, for the future. From where we stand today, and you've, you've explained it where we more or less stand uh, today, um, how can the jet be improved? So tell us maybe a bit about uh, one of the the big things that are uh, ongoing in the in the in the program, uh, which are I think called long-term evolution for Eurofighter. Yeah, so long-term evolution, uh, and let's say it's the fancy fancy marketing word for midlife update. Um, you know, but it's it's nothing bad. So obviously, long-term evolution. The jet has been around for a while now, as you said, Martin. We uh, uh, the Luftwaffe fielded it in two thousand four. Uh, I think the Brits uh, one year earlier, but let's say it's been around for fifteen ish years. So. Uh, goes without saying that uh, we need to do something with the jet to keep it relevant. Um, so um, besides, you know, uh, besides just getting rid of uh, old technology, just things that which are not around anymore, we really need to think where do we need to take that jet to be able to fill, uh, you know, the operation requirements that that uh, that that are happening now and for sure happening in the future. I mean, as you know, in the in the last decade, uh, we had lots of, uh, you know, the typical Afghanistan type scenarios. Let's say. Uh, where uh, there was a heavy demand on, on air to ground work, uh, uh, working together with troops on the ground, but let's say less what we call peer on peer. So work, uh, so having the jet face a, a threat that is as good as it as the jet itself, and that has certainly changed uh, in the last years. I mean, it's not supposed to be a political podcast, but so it's we need to take the jet, um, make sure the jet is, uh, is fit for that. Uh, and there's a lot of potential enemies out there which are fielding quite potent weapon systems. Um, and on the other hand, you know, we need to make sure that it's just not looking at can we make the jet go faster or higher or, you know, or, or do things quicker, but it's really about bringing the jet into the information age. Um, uh, the, the pace of change is really the key word. How can we get things onto the jet faster? Uh, you know, uh, my, my goal would be, and certainly all the colleagues uh, among the industry working on future business, to almost have it like an iPhone. You know, I, I need a new software and I'll just download it from the uh, Airbus, uh, Airbus app store, let's say, and put it on. Now, this is uh, obviously a very simplified way of explaining things, but 
it's these things for me, you know, just making the jet better in the things it's doing. But uh, above and, and foremost, what I need to do to keep it uh, relevant uh, in the information age. And that's really the critical task for us. And is there like a time horizon that you foresee for this, uh, for this uh, long-term evolution uh, for your fighter? What, what is the end state that you would foresee? Yeah, I mean, the best answer would be there is no end state. Uh, the weapon system always going to keep uh, evolutionizing. Um, but as far as the, let's say, contractual uh, uh, state goes, so we're right now we're in the in closing the study phase, the so-called LTE study phase, and and industry, and that being the foreign uh, industry, so VA Systems, Airbus Spain, Airbus Germany, uh, Leonardo, uh, and uh, VA Systems. Uh, we have uh, uh, we we feel that let's say different options. Um, in, in different work streams, so we'll look at the, at the jet in its entirety, and now the nations uh, will decide on, let's say, their picks. Uh, and from what the nations decide, and that's not always going to be the, you know, not every nation decides on the same things as every project. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a four national corporation, which also means a compromise in some ways. They will decide on uh, some, let's say, left and right borders from it, and uh, then we'll start going into development. And we expect to get a system definition so looking into really how does that system uh, how is that system going to look like uh to get into that uh maybe next year so uh the jets coming off let's say the factory line with an lt configuration depending on what you know uh how much is going to end up being in it right now it's 2027 to be honest which seems like a long time but we're really talking about a big big overhaul but we're looking also for opportunities to to pull some things forward so uh the, the answer would be 27 if you ask me being an optimistic person, some things will, will feel early around 20, 25, 26. One of the enhancements uh, to the Eurofighter that should actually come about more or less this year is the signature of the E-Scan radar contract. Exactly. Tell us what it will bring in terms of enhancements to the Eurofighter. Well, um, yeah, the E-Scan radar. Uh, so E-Scan for the people, I'm not going to make the same mistake again. So E-Scan stands for electronically scanned array. So uh, you have to imagine it that a radar dish if you've never seen one, just Google it. It's uh, easy to find. Um, it's like a, a lot, lots of small little radars. So uh, whereas in the past, I would have to steer the radar into one direction, I can now electronically scan or, uh, or steer individual beams. Um, this means that the radar is just way more agile. I, I, can, uh, you know, I can detect things further out. Obviously, it's, it's new technology, so it needs to get better. But it, the radar can do many tasks at the same time. Um, so um, up to now, I would have to say I'd like to do either air-to-air -air or air-to-ground. And with an e-scan radar, it enables me to do uh, many tasks at once, including electronic warfare as well. So it's just like a, you know going from a single knife, now going to a Swiss, uh, Swiss tool set knife. I can do many things at the same time. And uh, yeah, I mean, the radar is the single most important sensor. Uh, I use it to detect threats. I use it to engage threats. You know, I, I need to steer my missiles on it. Uh, not just in the, on the air, but in the ground. I needed to uh, uh, locate things uh, if I have bad weather. And I, I cannot use my, uh, my usual, let's say, visual, be it my targeting pod or my eyes. I need to find stuff with the radar. So, you know, um, the radar itself is not going to do it. But certainly, let's say this is the sensor that the rest of the weapon system is being built around. So it's absolutely critical uh, that we're getting this. Um, and uh, it's starting this year, first for the Kuwait, uh, so we're export customers. And then Germany and Spain will be the first ones uh, to get it in a couple of years in a bit more advanced version. Right. And we understand also, um, you know, Eurofighter is in, in several campaigns. And for the exportability of such, a, such an aircraft, uh, such an enhancement of the radar is critical, right? Yeah, it's absolutely necessary. So there's, a, there's, no, uh, there's no way you, you, you will, or ourselves or any company, uh, will sell a jet uh, without an e-scan radar these days. Let's come to Germany for a second. Uh, in Germany, uh, and and you're covering you're covering that market. It's a, it's one of our home nations. There is much talk about the tornado replacement, which is due due to the fact that the tornado is 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 an aging aircraft, um, and the potential choices that the German government has. How do you see the Eurofighter Typhoon positioned here in in this uh, in this in this matter? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, <laughs> I would be crazy if I would say uh, if I, I would say anything besides very good position. So, I mean, the typhoon, as I said, um, uh, the exciting thing about it is we're really on the uh, you know uh, renaissance might not be the best word, but uh, we're on the verge of creating a uh, a new jet. So it's going to look the same from the outside, but it's going to be diff uh, totally different from the inside. Uh, and if I would now directly compare it to the Hornet, so there are some things that we can definitely do better than the Hornet. There's other things which the horn is better. For instance, it has a bit uh, more uh, bigger legs, as we like to say, so more range. 
Um, the Hornet uh, has an e-scan radar already in it, um, but there's, like I said, other things that we can we can do much better. So at the end of the day, it, to me, it's not really about is the Typhoon a better airplane or fighter than the Hornet. It's more about the fact that, you know, with the Typhoon, the, the national customer, and let's not forget these are national programs, he is in the driving seat and, and really can, you know, define the way he wants his weapon system uh, to look like in the future. So uh, since we're just at the critical phase of doing exactly that, defining the weapon system, that is the major advantage. Uh, and obviously, as I said, you know, information age, uh, data, data is king. You know, it's absolutely critical uh, that you have full access to that, understand how your systems interconnect and, and work. So to me, that's really the, the biggest uh, benefit that I have, you know, full access to every, uh, every last square corner of that weapon system and can design it in a way which I would like to, obviously, as I said, in, in a, some sort of compromise with the four nations, but I definitely have full access and full visibility to it. And that, to me, uh, is a standout uh, feature. In, in the public discussion that we're seeing, um, there's much talk about the tornado replacement, but there is also the so-called Quadriga contract, which is, I guess, the, the Trench 1 replacement. And maybe to, to differentiate that for our audience a bit, um, how can we set those two apart? I mean, as far as I understand it, they're two different things, correct, Marco? Yeah, that's right. So Quadriga um, is, as you said, the Tranche 1 replacement. So uh, just because I know that questions sometimes linger, lingering around, how can it be that Tranche 1 is already outdated? I mean, Tranche 1, people forget that jet, as I said, it's been around for a while. Uh, and, and that Tranche, and by the way, it's exactly the same already with the F-35, which is a much newer weapon system. That first lot of airplanes, which weren't really that many, um, had just hardware which is too expensive to uh, let's say uh, keep within a supply chain so it was decided by uh, by germany at least um to uh, uh to get rid of those airplanes and rather buy new ones the uk and some other nations uh, they're still flying them but on a reduced basis so um what is the difference uh, with the quadriga tranche one replacement versus tornado quadriga tranche one replacement is just the continuation of what of the uh, of the jets which are being produced still at, at the moment so Obviously, there's new improvements in there. As I said, most prominently, they will uh, service uh, or have the e-scan radar. Um, they will obviously have you know newer technology in it, uh, newer computers, more computing power. But the features that we're looking into for LTE, for instance, uh, SATCOM connectivity, so satellite communication connectivity, uh, more fuel from uh, from inboard wet tanks, for instance, um, certain other things, which I uh, you know which. Uh, let's say not top secret, but I can't talk about here on the podcast, but really big, big, big uh, features, they will not be on those jets initially. They will certainly be retrofittable. That is the aim of LTE, of long-term evolution, everything retrofittable. But that jet, let's say, um, will be a newer version of what you have right now. And tornado replacement, at least this is, needs to be your aim, will be a revolutionized version of what you have right now. So maybe that's kind of the differentiator. That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good explanation. Uh, it's, it's. I think it's, it's good to have and, and good to know for for the audience. Um, Marco, Germany is also deeply um, together with um, France and Spain involved in the future combat air system, which is, as of more or less mid this century, supposed to be a a sixth generation uh, system of systems um, that is going to take. Um, air power to really the next level. Um, how can, and I've heard this often, you know, that we're saying Eurofighter is serving as a bridge to get there. How can you make that a bit more understandable what we mean by that? How does the Eurofighter Typhoon serve as a bridge to the future combat air system? I mean, there's there's two sides to it. So on the one hand side, uh, the Eurofighter Typhoon is the operational weapon system uh, living today that will also live in FCAS. So uh, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, maybe open heart surgery. So uh, while other uh, things within the FCAS environment, be it remote carriers, be it you know, combat cloud, uh, those things are just technology projects, let's say, to be matured. With Eurofighter, we're talking about a, a live weapon system. So it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not that easy to say, where do we, uh, let's say, um, uh, where do we use it as a technology maturity platform? You know, versus how do we uh, make it fit into the future FCAS environment? And to me, certainly, what I what we discussed earlier about tornado replacement LTE, that jet needs to fit within FCAS, um, and it's probably a little bit too much to say FCAS needs to fit within that jet. Um, but we need to really think about, you know, how to keep FCAS uh, real in the environment. Saying 
Um, sometimes um, when we talk about technology projects and we, you know, uh, we need to, let's say, not have any, any boundaries, we should certainly uh, think of how far we can go. But Eurofighter in some ways also grounds us uh, saying, hey, look, this is the program we know, this, these are the things that are working. So it's, uh, it's like I said, open heart surgery uh, on the one hand side, um, getting things in, SATCOM I mentioned, even eScan, uh, other sensors are things that will you know, make us understand the technology and then bridge it to FCAS. It will not also make us understand the technology, but these new technologies will define new ways of operating that weapon system, which then our, our customers, you know, the Air Forces, need to understand. Um, a good example is our network-enabled weapons. So uh, classically, I shoot a weapon, and my weapon system will support that weapon until impact. Already today and in the future, the, it will be, will be standard that I will deploy a weapon, and I will put that weapon into a network. And that weapon can be picked up from other platforms. Now, the technology side is the one thing, but the, uh, you know, how to handle that capability, the capacity is the next thing. And this is, like I said, what differentiates the Typhoon from the other things. It is an, oper an open heart surgery. And then, as I said, there, there are certain demonstrator versions we're looking at, you know, where, where we uh, uh, will feel things like uh, low observability, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, are more along the lines of, uh, of technology uh, maturation versus operational maturation. And as a, as, a, as a fighter pilot by trade and a fighter pilot by heart, uh, would you... Would you be looking forward to flying something like the like the future combat air system, uh, if you could? I hope I hope it comes soon, so uh, so I don't, I don't have to get pushed with a wheelchair to it. But yeah, of course. Yeah. So even with a wheelchair, I, I would hop in. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a uh, it's uh, although I love working for Airbus, uh, I honestly mean that. Uh, it's uh, still have a saddened heart when I look up and, and and I see the jets flying around, and I think anybody who's ever had that feels the same way. So yes, um, but. You know, I'm doing my part from the ground, and it's for the next generations to love that jet uh, and whatever comes in the future as much uh, as I loved the Eurofighter. Well, the good thing about your job and uh, where you're located in Munching is you get to see uh, you get to see some uh, and smell some of the the kerosene and the you hear the fighter jets flying overhead uh, every now and then. Um, Marco, um, maybe coming back to uh, to the roots. I mean. I would imagine we also have quite a few uh, youngsters listening to to such a podcast. You know, uh, being a fighter pilot is is something that you know a lot of kids dream about. I mean, I remember at least when I was a kid, I wanted to become a fighter pilot. It didn't work out, but but what advice would you have? I mean, um, what does it take to get, to become a fighter pilot, and what advice could you give to to young folks that might aspire to do exactly that? You know, as simple as just, you know, follow your dreams and you need to be able to really make some sacrifices. So uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's as, as always, there's also luck involved. So you'd say you need to have a healthy body and obviously also a healthy mind, but healthy body, you know, to, uh, to even make the first hurdles uh, when it gets to the physical examinations. But then uh, I think what people underestimate is the, the tenacity. So it's a, it's a pretty long road from, uh, uh, from you know, uh, showing up the first day until you sit in a, in a fighter jet cockpit and, you uh, I guess some people underestimate that. And, you know, while it's awesome, you know, going through all those steps, but uh, as I said, you know, sometimes my, my, my friends were having a good time at, at university and, you know, I was uh, studying my butt off uh, or, or I was having fun, but let's say in different, in different ways. So I think uh, first and foremost, you have to live that passion and you really have to want it. And if you really want it and, and you're really to, ready to sacrifice some things, then you will also have the stamina uh, to go through that. So. Uh, make sure that's not something you want to do just because you saw Top Gun or Top Gun 2, but make sure it's something you do because, you know, that is that is your dream. Uh, and that, you know, with uh, some work and some luck will get you uh, pretty far away uh, to the cockpit. Sounds great. Before we conclude, um, in the fighter pilot world, uh, everyone has a call sign. And I understand yours is Gumby. Oftentimes, there's a funny story behind those call signs. Is that the case... Uh, is that the case with Gumby as well? Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, everybody thinks that these call signs uh, be from Top Gun or now Top Gun 2, maybe for the younger ones like Maverick or Iceman. But most of the call signs uh, actually have to do with, uh, as we like to say, heinous or embarrassing stories. Um, so if you ever meet anybody who, who says his call sign is Maverick or Iceman, you can uh, be a bit cautious. He's probably lying to you. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, the story, um, it has nothing to do with my name, by the way. I'll, I'll start off with that. So... Uh, in, in pilot training, you have these so-called out and backs. So you fly to different base um, just to see, get familiarized with different operations, et cetera. And 
uh, in my case, the first one was to New Orleans uh, in the U.S., and uh, we flew on an extremely hot, extremely humid summer day. Uh, we flew there. The, uh, uh, we're supposed to turn around the jet, so, you know, uh, get gas and then fly back home a couple of hours later. But it turned out that there was a tornado warning, which uh, happens almost every day uh, in that uh, area in the summer, so we had to stay overnight. Uh, the problem was that uh, our uh, flight suits were absolutely drenched, uh, sweat. Uh, the T-38, the trains we flew, don't have the best, uh, the best air conditioning. And so uh, we uh, went to a burger joint just across the street from the Air Force Base, actually Naval Base it was, and there they had a limbo contest uh, that day, just by chance. And uh, the, uh, the person uh, or the, the, the team that won the limbo contest would get free T-shirts. Now, as the T-shirts are totally filled with sweat, I said, okay, let's do this. And myself being the youngest one uh, on that trip, I was four pilots, uh, I was the one nominated to the limbo contest. And now uh, to get the story short, uh, the uh, the person I was to, supposed to go against uh, probably weighed like four times as much as I do. Uh, and I'm not the slimmest. So uh, I think it was around 300 pounds, or 350 pounds probably. And, uh, and then that limbo bar was set to about, let's say my eyebrows or maybe my nose. So not really that big of a challenge. Uh, the other guy, uh, the slightly bigger person, did not manage to take that hurdle. And so I, uh, I beat him uh, and I went uh, below that limbo bar. And then he goes around and says, man, you're as flexible as Gumby. Uh, how, how did you do that? And I said, how, you know, how the hell does he know my name? Because we, we didn't have an, our name tags. And it turns out that Gumby uh, is a U.S. cartoon character that uh, is like a clay person, a clay character that can bend in all sorts of ways and directions. So that, with some you know other stories that were totally made up um, and which are not true, uh, then in the naming ceremony uh, they gave me the name Gumby, and that just kind of because at the end of the day it also has to reflect my name. That uh, that's where the story comes from. So there are worse stories, but it's certainly not a cool hero story. All right, well that's a that's a great story, uh, Marco, uh, and certainly a well deserved uh, uh, name call sign. Uh, and uh, what a coincidence that it matches with your last name. Um, let's wrap it up here. Uh, Marco, thanks a lot for being with us on the show today. Thank you, Martin. Uh, see you soon, hopefully uh, in, uh, in live ways. We would have loved to, uh, to do this podcast uh, in, in live mode, but uh, yeah, we're in uh, the corona times here, so uh, it wasn't possible. We had to tape this, but nonetheless, thanks for your time. This was a great chat. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our edition of our podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you are on Apple Podcasts, rate and review it. You can follow us all on social media. Simply use the hashtag WeMakeItFly to get in touch with us. Give us your feedback. Good, bad, indifferent, doesn't matter. We want to know what you think. This edition was produced and edited by Sandra Walter. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Bye.